and welcome. I'm Lindy Fox, fashion designer, and welcome to the Visalia Arts Consortium September meeting. I was born and raised here in Visalia, California, and I went to school at FIDM in Los Angeles, which is a fashion school. I left here when I was 18 after high school to attend that school. From there, I moved to New York City in 2008 where I did a combination of working and also more schooling. I went to the Fashion Institute of Technology. And then from there, my husband and I came back to Visalia to just kind of see what kind of opportunities were here and be near family. And yeah, it's just exciting to see where creativity is happening everywhere, really. I first learned how to sew when I was in junior high. It was actually at a home ec class, but I didn't really know that that would end up being my career path. I just knew that I wanted to make things and use my hands. From there, I just grew more and more interested in, in fashion and what I was seeing from magazines and the internet by that time. I, mean, I knew basic sewing, but I was just curious about the whole industry how do these beautiful garments come to life? And it's funny because growing up and when I was a teenager and kind of those formative years, I thought that a fashion designer was just like one person in a room being a creative genius, sort of how a fine artist is portrayed, like a painter. When I first went to the Fashion Institute in Los Angeles, I chose a major that was kind of a hybrid of design and manufacturing, and they call that product development. So we, we learned the, all of the steps in the process. Um, we honed our, like fine-tuned our drawing skills. Of course, you know, everything starts really with a drawing and then gets kind of finessed and turned into a technical drawing, which is a like a very zoomed in look at a garment and not just kind of the fanciful drawing, but it's more of a technical, you know, as a fashion designer, you don't have to be phenomenally talented at drawing. You just have to um, get it to a point where someone can, can see your drawing and not have too many questions about what, what you want to um, have made. Um, and there's two there. It's funny because there's two different types of fashion sketching or really three different types I should say there's like the rudimentary sketching in a sketchbook of just getting ideas out that are really um just really crude um and they're just the beginnings of an idea then there's illustration which is a beautiful drawing in and of itself regardless of what the garment is the drawing as a whole is beautiful it's an illustration and then there's technical drawing which is um, could either be done with a very precise hand with um, ink and paper or um, to make it really flawless, you'd be doing that in as a, a vector program like, like Illustrator on the computer. Um, I prefer to do it just because it's so sharp and crisp. Beam goes from here to here. There's a dart here that's three inches tall. Those types of very specked out drawings. And then from there, then you would do your either draping with muslin on a dress form to get the shape and the feel and the, the whole 3D dimension of a garment. Or you could also go into straight into pattern making, which is with paper on a drafting table, um, the 2D dimensions that make up a garment. Um, you can kind of do a hybrid of those or you could do um, or you could go straight to paper patterning. So we learned all of those steps. And then from there, you translate all of that into a tech pack, which is essentially the way you'd have a blueprint for a house. A tech pack is like the blueprint for a garment that then gets presented to a factory that you, then you start building a relationship with a manufacturer and just specking out your garment and making sure that it's a collaborative process as well, even with that. I realized once I got deeper into that program that a designer and, and clothing and any sort of brand label that you see on clothing is not just one designer in a room working by themselves. It's quite the opposite. It's very collaborative and a garment passes through so many hands before it ends up loved by you in your closet and worn. The first garment I created from scratch was a simple pencil skirt and it was 
like a canvasy but soft and comfortable woven fabric that was pink, kind of like a magenta pink. But to give it sort of some interest, I embroidered. I took how Kodak film, when you would take your film to get developed and then they would give you the actual film with the sprockets. I cut those apart and treated them like embroidery and whip stitched them on in three different layers onto the bottom hem just to add an interesting embroidery with that cool black and brown shimmery effect that, that is film. That was the first garment I ever made. I've grown a lot since that time. That was actually one of the first things that I did to get accepted into the design program at FIT in New York. And so since then, since completing my bachelor's degree in design at FIT, I actually took a concentration at that school in knitwear. So anything from hand knitting to machine knitting, it's kind of like a computer programming design that then goes into a, a super powerful machine, knitting machine. I definitely took a strong interest in knitwear and still have um, that, that knitwear interest. I did a deep dive into that. You know, when I was learning and I was a, you know, late teen, early 20s, when I was kind of first learning how to actually make something with my hands, I, I played it safe in a sense. I, I, <laughs> I remember feeling like I didn't want to mess up. I wanted to make sure that if I were going to sit down and make something, you know, 15 years ago that I would want to make sure that I didn't mess it up because um, I thought that'd be a waste of time or something. You can't avoid that anyway in the development and iteration phase and there's definitely um, happy accidents that happen. So I think I I've run into a lot of happy accidents I think as I get in when I do a deep dive into the, um, the beginning like con concept phase of designing. Um, so now I think I just, uh, I stray from the rules now more, I would say. And that started happening. I think I felt confident to stray from the rules in my last year at university is when I finally felt um, confident enough to, to stray away and have something be outside of the box, I guess you could say. There's this rule, I guess you could say, that is in the fashion world where, okay, fashion is clothing, therefore it has to be wearable and it has to sell. Um, and, and certainly that is a part of it because, um, you know, one thing that fashion, where fashion's not like fine art is that it is a business. And at the end of the day, you know, enough of your clothing does have to sell um, to keep going, to be able to still have a business, to keep the lights on. Um, but there's, I think there has to be that balance, though, of not letting that mentality bog me down. Um, just always thinking very practical about selling can sometimes curtail my creativity. Um, in the early stage of developing a new collection, I have to, I have to kind of be by myself, um, not have much input from other people and just start sketching, start putting together mood boards. Um, sometimes I'll clip something that's inspiring, um, that's an image and, and make that into a digital collage. And all of that is in the concepting phase, of course. Um, and I have to make sure that I don't even let my own editing thoughts come in during that about selling and profit margin. And there's just a lot of that that's more downstream that can, if that's already coming into your head during the creation phase, then I know for me, then I might already be editing and watering down my designs. Whereas um, there's times in a collection, at least when you have more room to push the envelope in a collection there, I think there should be the balance between things that people um, recognize. There should be some element of recognition. It is still clothing that goes on the, the human body. And to recognize that, how it how it fits into their existing wardrobe, but also pushing the envelope a little bit, the type of customer who, who wants that in their, um, in their closet and the way they express themselves, where they think, okay, that's kind of the next iteration of how I wanna express myself and evolve my style. Um, and I think that that comes when I don't listen to the rules about, well, what sold last season well, just, staying forward thinking and a little bit risk taking without being too confusing, I think. And that's kind of that, that alchemy. It's hard, I think, to strike that balance.
if you predict it too early, let's say, something could change in the market, let's say, or, or even your own customer as a brand could kind of divert in a different way than you expected. But then if you wait a little too late, maybe to make a creative decision about um, what to put in your collection, um, then you may not have time to get it done. I'm like a supply chain nerd. I love it all. Um, and it's kind of, it kind of goes in hand with like world economics. And I just find that endlessly fascinating um, to see how interconnected we all are. So the fashion industry is a really good example of that because, you know, you have fiber being grown in one country and it, that could be being spun into yarn somewhere else, which could then be woven into fabric somewhere else, which could then be shipped to a factory to make into, of course, a sewn garment somewhere else. There's a lot of interdependence, um, which can, I think can be a really beautiful thing. It brings our world closer together, but you have to think about like all these people who've um, ha who played a part to bring a garment to its final stage of, and how there's price and dollar amounts that go into every stage of that supply chain that when someone's getting something at like 80% off, no one's making money at that point. Um, so you don't want overly priced garments, of course, but you can't have deep, deep discounts too. Cause at that point, um, it, it, it's robbing someone along the line of their due pay essentially. Um, and it'll have a, it'll have a ripple effect that affects, um, usually, unfortunately, the, the most vulnerable are the ones who get the most taken advantage of. And that's usually the garment workers. It's like a Tetris game, like removing one thing, it shifts something else. And, um, so I've, I've been able to witness how, how hard people work, um, stateside to, try to ensure that their products are being made um, in the up to the standard of, of ethics and fair wage. So that that repetition of like always hunting for the deepest discount can be pretty harmful. But I also understand, of course, like people people can afford what they can afford. You know, I mean, it's not always not everyone can afford the luxury of um, a luxury product, let's say. Um, but I think that just keeping in mind the more we know about like where our clothing comes from, I think that affects our choices to be a little more mindful. So it's a hard, it's a hard issue to tackle, but I like talking about it because I think that it's, um, it's, I think that customers are becoming general public too, are becoming more aware of it and mindfulness, like mindful, um, shopping, and so I think that that's really encouraging. Um, I know like 20 years ago that that wasn't part of like the collective conversation. So I find that really encouraging that people are just more educated about that now, but we still have a ways to go for sure. Um, and it's a layered topic and n no one can really say that they know ev everything or that they're the ultimate authority on that. But, um, you know, doing your the best you can with the research that you have at any given time is I think that's the responsible thing to do. I think it's exciting to learn more about how we're all interconnected and how like collaboration is truly, I mean, that's what gets us to where we are and where we're going. Um, when it comes to my personal brand, the, the Lindy Fox clothing line, um, that's all made in the US. It's all made locally. Um, so that's a lot easier to, um, see what's being done ethically. I'm of the mind that, especially when you're small, to utilize local talent. So, you know, I was in New York and I worked with local New York makers. You know, if I was in Italy, I would find, um, qualified people to work with there. If I was in Vietnam, I would utilize the local talent there, you know? So I think that that is a benefit of just celebrating local talent, that that can happen anywhere you're at. Every place has kind of specialized local talent within arm's reach. I, I actually get inspired by color palettes first. I think that that is um, where I, when I think about it, it's actually how I've started each collection.
not realizing it at the time, but that's the pattern for me. Um, it'll start with a color palette and a combination of colors that I want to use to flesh out a full collection. Um, and then from there, um, sometimes I'll just be draw kind of drawing in an abstract way shapes and lines that I want to use. So um, if it's more curvy and organic, you know, that, that will translate into style lines, sewn lines. Even the garments themselves could have more of a diaphanous, um, soft feel versus, you know, a collection that could be more harsh angles. Um, so that's kind of how I start the very beginning. And then, um, and then I'll start sketching uh, on a figure, of course, a human figure, and start actually drawing clothing in a sketch form, and then just kind of keep fleshing it out and iterating it, and then placing all of my drawings on a table and start kind of arranging a flow of a collection and like how to, if it's, if it's going into the fashion show format, you know, opening looks, middle looks, and closing looks. Um, and kind of that, the feeling that I would want, um, an audience to, to feel how, how those unfold and then close with a finale. A look just means like any given full complete look on a person. Um, so of course that could be a shirt and a top, or it could be a lot of things, a shirt, a vest, a trench coat, a bottom, a handbag, a hat. That's all of course one look too. Um, so for me, what I've done thus far, um, I've shown um, five looks at a time. So really short capsule collections um, on a runway show because they've been in group shows. Um, I haven't yet actually had a dedicated fashion show of a, of a full, full collection, which would be more like 15 to 30 looks would be a full show. See, I, I consider it a great honor to be uh, picked to be part of um, some group shows. Um, and I think, so I've been in three and they were in New York. Um, and they were when I was in university actually. Um, and it's kind of fun. The, the best one or the most exciting one I should say was actually this kind of annual show that would take place between FIT, the school I went to and our kind of quote unquote rival. Um, but it was fun, a uh, school called Parsons, both in Manhattan. And, uh, they would pick, I think it was like 15 students from each school to um, create a five look capsule collection and send it down the runway. And we would, it was very collaborative because we, all of the designers, so all 30 would um, share models and have to coordinate um, how that would happen backstage to get the models um, into their next look, which could, would be for another designer. So it was a lot of coordinating and um, cooperation uh, and then it was actually a competition show, which just added a fun element um, that friends and family would come see. And um, there were judges uh, in the front row who would um, cast their votes about which school, it would be more of a school win, um, who would win that year um, based on the 15 designers from each school. But there was a lot of talent and it was, it was really cool to see um, student talent and the collaborative aspect and how how actually a lot of competition that you would think would be there went away um, and it just became about cooperation and just mutual respect and admiration and um, kind of championing championing each other on uh, that was great I, that was a really fun experience for me and like I said it was a real honor to be chosen I got to do that Two times. I've had a photo shoot, I think one, um, one photo shoot here and it was here in Visalia in a cotton field um, because that was a whole collection that I made um, that I, I just had a vision about that. That whole collection was inspired by um, this region and how I grew up on a farm and um, cotton fields here. And so I had that um, more of an, in an editorial style photo shoot um, with a model in, in an open field when the um, cotton bowls were actually showing, so the beautiful white um, everywhere in the field. And just getting my clothing photographed in that sort of, uh, the original inspiration was really gratifying and full circle for me because that is kind of in my work 
in subtle ways all the time. I think, I know I see it because because I know it's there from my um, earliest formative years, um, but the collection I'm speaking about, it was much more obvious. It was like, this is the whole story of this collection. So I wanted to photograph it in its, in its inception point, really. So of course, the majority of my working career thus far has been in New York, and I, I've worked for two years in Los Angeles. Um, the thing that is most different maybe about New York City is just the crazy drive and work ethic, um, which can, which is a good thing, of course, but um, can be really, uh, can turn quickly into like a workaholic spirit. Um, so, you know, there were times at jobs when I'd be in the office for 12 hours at a time, consistently every single day with like no end in sight and weekends and I remember the worst was like being on the cutting room floor in a way, arranging these boards with some teammates and getting ready for a presentation. So of course, you know, it's, it's seasonal. Um, it's not like you're always there till four in the morning, but we were there till four in the morning. <laughs> um, you know, just wild, but in, in some ways it kind of felt like college and you, you get kind of close to your coworkers because you're like, so tired and it really felt like college sometimes in in a good way though even when you're exhausted um, I feel new to the arts community in Tulare County um, even though I grew up here so I was a little bit aware of it but now um, as an adult you know it, I have a different perspective and I'm I'm focusing on it more I'm seeking it out I'm I'm more hungry for it I guess I should say um, so my perception of it is that I'm kind of learning and in a seeking mode and wanting to um, find out more about um, local artists and celebrate them and, um, you know, finding work that I love and just getting behind that to show my support. And um, yeah, having collaboration. Um, I, it's funny because right before this, I just got a text, kind of a group text of um, the beginnings of what could maybe be something that involves fine art and photography and some of my clothing, probably a photo shoot of some kind. Um, and I'm really, I'm really into that. I'm, I'm just excited to see um, and meet people who are doing things and hungry. I mean, it's no matter where you're at, like it's about that drive and that hunger and that desire to create art, whether that's alone or collaboratively. But um, I know I gravitate more toward a collaborative work environment. We have the ability to work remotely, which has greatly benefited me in a lot of ways. Um, but it's also, it's isolating. And I miss, I miss going into the office and being with people and that sort of that energy and that buzz. I would love to know more about what's happening here. Get as many experiences as possible when you're young and starting out in this career. Or if you're not that you have to be young to start out in this career because I know a lot of people who um, had one career for 10, 20 years and then pivoted and came into the fashion industry. And I think that's really exciting um, just to have different perspectives. So I would say gain as, gain as much variety of experience as you can. Um, be willing to work really hard. Sometimes those long hours will happen. Um, but that everything you do and experience, even if it seems mundane, is never wasted. And it all adds up to um, either your resume or a portfolio and just your experience, even though they, they call it those soft skills sometimes. Um, just that everything's valuable, I think. And to not underestimate the small things, that those actually really add up. Well, I'm actually wearing... Something exciting today. Um, my top is vintage, but it's actually vintage Givenchy, which is pretty exciting because it's not every day that you would find that in like a thrift store, but that's where I found this. Um, I think it's from the 70s. Well, you can kind of tell from the tag that that era. Um, but what I like about it is that it's actually knit um, and it has different stitches like a rib, a jersey, and, um, well, this is Jersey too, but they use like a slubby yarn. So it adds a cool interest um, to make a stripe just out of texture. So I love that. And then my jeans are from Reformation, which is just a cool brand based out of LA that I like. My shoes 
are from also another Los Angeles brand called Intentionally Blank. And they actually, their logo is like intentionally and then they have a line. But, um, but they call themselves Intentionally Blank. And they're, they're just very cool. They're very, um, they're um, just pretty forward thinking, but without, without being, like without alienating a customer. I think they're really cool. So for this uh, technique that I'll show you, it's just um, a fun way to add texture to an otherwise flat woven fabric. So um, I say woven fabric because um, if you were to use a knit fabric for this technique, um, it might be too slippery and stretchy as it's going through the machine. It might pull and what you need for this technique is, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sew tucks and then vertically and then sew them in rows horizontally alternating to make kind of a cool zigzag texture as you'll see. Um, but the best um, fabric to use for this is like the one I'm using, which is like a very kind of stiff and flat, no stretch at all in this kind of fabric. Um, because that way it'll hold all of your tucks that you're going to make um, without stretching or torquing, which a knit would probably do. Yeah, I get fabric wherever wherever it is that I fall in love with something that, um, that I see. Um, I've gotten fabric from so many different sources, but um, if you're doing small batch production that, that I do for my line, one thing that's nice about that is that you don't have to find a fabric that has a super high quantity left for you to use. Um, so you can use dead stock fabric is what they call it when it's um, a fabric that's no longer being produced or it's a remnant leftover. And that's a really easy way to, um, to stay sustainable is to use um, fabric that would otherwise end up in landfill and I love doing that. It's really gratifying. And also the fabrics that I find that are dead stock are more unique that way. And um, you're able to save them in a way. And um, so this machine, this is just my domestic machine that I, that I use for my personal use. Um, it's a baby lock. It's domestic, like I said. It has a bunch of different stitches, though. It works really well. It's pretty impressive for being a home machine. But... Um, but uh, factories, of course, and professional seamstresses would use an industrial sewing machine, probably a Juki brand. And those kind of come attached into a big table um, and they're really impressive and they, I feel like they never break. They're in, indestructible, they're amazing. Um, so one day I would love to have an industrial machine for myself, but right now I'm able to get by with this. And then I also own in my studio that I've set up here in Visalia, um, I have also a serger, like an overlock serging machine. And then I also have a knitting machine. So yeah, I always need a lot of space to spread out. <laughs> so um, the first step in creating this technique for texture is to sew um, vertical pin tucks. I'm, I'm kind of a small person, so oftentimes when I make clothes that are for my brand or samples, they're just a little bit taller and bigger proportions for than, than I can wear. But, um, but every so often I'll make something that's small enough for me to wear. Um, <laughs> but that's sometimes a bummer to not be like the exact sample size. So there's a lot of samples that I have for my brand hanging in my closet that I just can't wear. They would look so big on me and kind of ridiculous. You'd obviously want to make a full size set um, from the smallest to the largest to be inclusive of, of all your customers. But where you'd have that choice in order to like create different standards of beauty and, and inclusive standards of beauty, obviously what it should have been all along, um, is how you show your initial ideas and your initial samples. 
um, and on your own website and in editorials. So it's it's for you having that responsibility as a designer and also like every kind of player in the creative space in the industry um, has that choice to show something different that we haven't seen. Um, I see improvements in the industry. Like it's it's getting better and better, but it's just, it's been a little slow to, to get there. Um, but there's there's progress happening. There's a lot of things to be excited about and it's actually pretty easy to find people who are doing it right as well, um, just as easily as it is to see people who aren't, so. And I'll do one more and then we'll do the horizontal ones to create a zigzag sort of a tucking texture. I think it's just fulfilling to, um, just to use your hands to create things. Um, and obviously fashion design is one of those very hands-on um, working with material um, forms of craft. And that's, I think that what draws me always back to fashion as my medium is fabric. It's the textiles. Um, that's kind of my first love. I think my first love truly, I can say, um, is, is textiles and fabric. And that's why I, that's kind of how I get inspired too, is pairing fabrics with movement that's in my head for that. I definitely do have experience working with other designers, um, both, you know, when I was a student and when I was helping, you know, create and help produce that fashion show that I spoke about earlier. Um, and then in the working world as well, um, you're, when you're paid to design, you're on a design team and that's collaborative as well, very collaborative. Um, and yeah, competition can come up, but you know, fashion gets this reputation for being very competitive and you see it exaggerated on shows like Project Runway and things like that. But again, that's also TV. It's exaggerated, it's a caricature. Um, but there is some competition for sure in like the working world, but I don't think it's any more than any other office environment um, because Unfortunately, sometimes humans behave that way. And, but I don't think that's unique to fashion at all. <laughs> um, but I think sometimes TV shows portray that to be maybe a bit more backstabbing and catty than, than I've actually seen. Thankfully, I haven't seen it manifest too crazy in the working world, <laughs> with a couple exceptions maybe, but you know, everybody has their day. So this is step one, which is creating your, um, I'll show you vertical uh, pin tucks. And um, now we'll just do a quick horizontal back and forth stitch to create, um, to kind of hold down the tucks in certain places to create the fun texture. At one of the fashion shows that, that I did when I was in school, um, you know, our models were told just to walk straight, pretty normal, normal walk down the runway. And one of my models, um, it was a Friday night, I think, and she came to the show drunk. And, you know, we still, the show must go on, so she still wore my look. But instead of just having a normal walk on stage, it was, she decided to make it her moment and do a couple twirls. And she had the audience in stitches, but we were a little bit like, oh, it looks a little crazy. So that was a that was a jaw dropping kind of moment of silliness, but um, but it was also kind of funny, and I kind of love that story a little bit. But that was something unexpected. <laughs> what else? I'm trying to think if I have any other mishaps. 
so many mishaps that would happen in the workroom just when you're creating garments. Um, you know, like running out of the right fabric in the right dimension that you would need, running out of pattern paper, that happened all the time. That always, always would happen with pattern paper. Um, especially like when you have a deadline and you're already having to stay up late to finish it, that would be stressful of just running out of supplies. Um, because I think that's something that is hard about, about making clothes is the supplies for that are not always readily available. Um, some stuff has to be ordered online depending on where, where you live. And so it can be stressful if you run out unexpectedly and you have to wait for a shipment. Um, and of course, the costs are high. A lot of fabric is expensive. Um, and so you want to be careful about not wasting that, both because of environmental impacts and how much money you spent to get it. So you can kind of see the beginnings of what this is starting to look like with the back and forth zigzag. I feel like in some ways I've been a little out of the loop on things because I've been like adjusting to new parent life. <laughs> Haven't been as aware of a lot of things. But. One more stitch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's just such a different lifestyle. Um, but yeah, it's so rewarding and amazing. But um, you know, it's a different type of time management, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, that's the last stitching line. So as you can see, this is kind of the end result. So you can see it's this cool zigzag texture here just taking taking what was a flat piece of fabric and making it texturized. Something that anyone could really do it if you have a sewing machine at home. So I think this is a cool technique. So um, again, I'm Lindy Fox, fashion designer. Um, my work can be viewed at lindyfox.com, my website there. Um, and you can subscribe to my newsletter on that page. And you can also feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is lindy at lindyfox.com. I look forward to hearing from you and just sharing my work and connecting. Thanks everyone for joining us for the September Arts Consortium meeting and we hope to see you next month.